Welcome to Get Moving TV. I'm Dr. Chris Landon and I serve as your host. Here in Ventura, we've really tried very hard to uh, develop the Faro Center for Innovation. This has been able to attract and bring out all these innovative people, technology, uh, innovators, engineers, and we bring them together in one place where they've been hidden uh, uh, off in their, their dark corners there. Uh, Matthew today is from uh, Parkway Business Solutions yep. and has emerged really to help out these, these small company. So Matthew, welcome to Get Moving TV. And Thank you. So how did you get in, how, attracted or involved with this uh, Center for Innovation in Camarillo? You know, when, uh, when we were first starting up with Parkway, one of our very first clients was uh, Spire Entrepreneur Education, uh, Sean Bardwaj. He is one of the founding members of the Faro Center, along with the Wendt brothers. And when we were first starting in to go down the pathway of, of setting up the Faro Center, it, uh, boy, it's been a, a fun journey. We were, our goal was to have the ability to have a one-stop shop inside of a building where anybody that would had an idea could come figure out whether it was a good idea, whether there was a market for it, and then have the, the businesses that were necessary along the way, such as accounting, um, that can help them succeed, basically. Well, I spend a lot, I try and show up at least once a week and, and review uh, uh, companies for them and take, I have a background in women's clothing and not wearing them, but uh, having, <laughs> a, having a, a little manufacturing plant and jewelry and of course medical and medical mm -hmm. devices. And uh, it's surprising how many people starting out don't realize how complex it is and what yeah. a long process it is to get and have a successful business. So how, how do you go about uh, counseling people? Do you meet them there by Zoom? How do you go about counseling people? You know, it's, it's interesting that you said it that way. It is a very long journey. Um, my background's always been in managing small businesses, but thanks to Aspire, we actually went through their accelerator program for an idea we had, and it was the first time I had the chance to actually figure out if my idea was a good idea or not, to do the research, basically, as you would say, the dog food, you know, eat your own dog food on it. Um, and that's really been extremely helpful because now we've got both the accounting aspect of it, how that works, but we can tie in together the actual process of what does it take to pitch an idea? You've got to create it, to take it, pitch it to somebody else. Find out, will they even spend a dollar on it or not? Uh, I mean, we're two and a half years in and uh, uh, we just, just went to beta for our application. The application is called VendorSync, and it's a QuickBooks desktop application. So we try to utilize our experiences along the way. The most important part of that has been all of the supporting people around us that have helped us learn also. So now we want to pay it back, pay it forward, and try to help the other people that are going through the same journey. Well, I, I have been in the software thing since 1969, which is, seems like a long time now. And we, you know, we used to pull out literally bugs. We would pull up the <laughs> floor, and there's cockroaches interfering with the circuits. Uh, so every iteration that comes out for Adobe, Lightwave, for everything. Oh, yeah. I, I have people who just quit teaching it because it's just a little too much. In Excel, my gosh, it's gotten so hard to for me to, mm -hmm. to get through all the features. So how, how do you help a business owner along? Is there? So I'm really lucky that my favorite procrastination has been checking out websites like Product Hunt or Beta List, and I'm always looking to find out what's the new greatest application that's going to be coming out so we can stay informed for our clients. Having done that, it really started to help me see the pictures of how to connect the dots together. So our practice Parkway, we primarily use QuickBooks Online for all of our clients. And we've transitioned to that because it makes it so much more convenient for them and for us. Uh, it used to be that if you had your accountant was trying to do anything in the books, you had to be out of it, which means either we're doing it really late at night or you're not doing anything in it. QuickBooks Online has made it to where we can both be in there simultaneously, and it really changed the face of accounting, that and other programs like Xero. Uh, previously, a company was forced to kind of build its workflow around what the accounting platform would let it do. Now, you are basically with the cloud, you can design the accounting to meet the needs of the business, especially with all the apps on the market. Um, so what we really try to do is we try to make sure that we understand what our clients' workflow needs are. You know, the workflow is the idea of how do they get uh, their customer into the door through the purchase process and 
really to get back to repeat again. Um, there's going to be different internal things that they do all the way through. So we try to understand every aspect of that so we can see if there's bottlenecks or uh, redundancies that could be removed and make things more efficient to make them more profitable. So any small business can, can benefit yeah. from Sears, which is becoming a small and smaller business all the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, but just anybody starting out really could, could use that from your local escape house room to a uh, uh, restaurant or someone selling paper, or medical supplies. And yeah. So it's, it's, uh, the, the whole workflow is an uh, inter interesting area. How did you educate yourself about workflow? You know, ever since I was a little kid, I've always been fascinated with computers. And actually, it probably goes back even further than that. When I was younger, my dad would always tell me, stop looking for angles, stop looking for angles, stop looking for angles. And it wasn't until I got a little bit older I, I finally realized that there was a response to it, which is, what's wrong with trying to find an easier, more efficient way to get a job done, so long as it's honest and ethical by your standards? So because of that, it started a lot around data entry. Uh, as accountants, <laughs> we have to do a lot of typing in Excel. I don't like it. <laughs> I don't think many do. So I kept trying to find ways to get out of doing that, and we, I, that's kind of how we dove into this. We started looking into different applications that could help us pull data in and out of an accounting platform. Um, I remember the, the time that I was looking at QuickBooks Online, and it just kind of struck me like, it's just a database of numbers. And if you look at it first from that aspect, you can do some really cool things pretty fast pushing and pulling the data in. And once you get it there, then you still have to have that accounting knowledge to go in and finesse the numbers and make sure they're correct and accurate for your people. So through that, we ended up figuring out if we use this application with this, if we were to uh, take our client that has paper invoices, we can have them type them into a basic spreadsheet, we can push it into the program and just dramatically increase our efficiency. It's been great. Well, part, of, part of what we like to talk about here, we'll spend the last couple of minutes, yeah. uh, is just the arc. So you started, I guess, before you were born, probably selling things in the uterus there. Or, <laughs> uh, kind of. Yeah, National so raffle salesman for Bounders United, I think it was at eight years old. So, um, so how'd you work the angles with Bounders United there? Um, I worked the fact I was a cute little kid, my mom said, to go and get people to buy more tickets and was by far their top salesperson. But I was going out and I was making change. I was selling tickets, you know, just engaging. Mm -hmm. um, Ironically, one of the things my parents always say they feel the worst about is that we moved a lot. Three elementary schools, two middle schools, three high schools. I thank them for it. Because of that, I'm more social, more open. Uh, you learn to make friends very quickly, and it's, it helped quite a bit. So even starting from an early age, you just, I learned real quickly, you just got to dive in. You just got to do it. So. Well, thank you, Matthew. Ventura, it's all you eight-year-olds who are watching the show. It's time for you to <laughs> get moving. And you know, small businesses, really, this is workflow, everything. They're, they're the right place to go. Welcome back, Ventura. We are so fortunate uh, to have our own city historian. Uh, and in doing so, as he's collected some remarkable facts about uh, Ventura. We'll hear about quite a few of these. Well, I'm glad to be here. My name is Richard Sennett, and for 22 years I was a historian for the city of Ventura. I retired back in 2005, but I still do tours and answer historical questions for them. And being a city historian is a, a really an amazing kind of job. You are part city booster, part researcher. It was a lot like being in college. Someone would call up the mayor and say, well, who was the first Jewish family in Ventura? And he would, of course, call me up. I would write a paper quickly and give it to him, and then he would call them back, and everyone would think he's so smart. <laughs> By the way, it was the Simon Cohen family, if you're at all sure. interested. Uh, but Ventura has a unique history. It started out as a Chumash Native American village of about a thousand people called Shishalop, and then it grew from there to a mission station, San Buenaventura, and then out of that little mission station, a, a Mexican village, and then later an American town. It was never very big. It was always a little wide spot in the road, really, 
with just a few houses and adobes on either side of Main Street. But it wasn't until the 1880s that they started to really change. Now, back in those early days, our economy was based on cattle. So steers going a thousand head down Main Street were common in the 1850s. In fact, it was so common that the very first law the city of Ventura passed, which is still on the books, by the way, is make, making it illegal to drive cattle down Main Street. You could be severely fined for that if you should do it today. Now, did that bother the ranchers? No. It only applies to Main Street. As long as you drive them down Thompson or Santa Clara, that's all right. But don't do it on Main Street. That was our first law we have. We were formed as a city in 1866, and making us one of the older cities in Southern California. And from that time on, we were kind of a small town until there was a great drought in the 1860s. It didn't rain a drop for two years. And what happened? All the cattle died. Many of the cattle turned to eating cactus because it has water in it. But then the spines got in their stomach and they died. In fact, one rancher said in a letter that you could walk from Santa Barbara to Los Angeles on the carcasses of dead cattle and never once tread your boot to the dirt. Now, I don't know if that was facetious, but it, it wiped out all the rancheros. Now, the Americans got the land cheap. They had loaned money to the rancheros, and most were wiped out. But then, what would they do with it? Just so happens that a new crop came from South America. Lima beans. Oh, by the way, where do they come from? Lima, Peru. We're mispronouncing their name. It should be Lima beans. But anyway, they grow wonderfully here in Ventura. And Ventura became the lima bean capital of the nation. We were shipping trainloads of it out throughout the nation. But here's a problem. Americans don't mind making the money, don't mind owning the land, but who's going to put those lima beans in the ground and harvest them? Well, the Latino people do that thankless, backbreaking job today. It's great we have them in Ventura County to do that work. But there weren't many Latinos here. And those that were in Ventura were all in the cattle business. So are you ever, think about it, are you ever going to talk a cowboy into getting off his horse and picking beans? Never. By the way, what did they do? They got on their horses and rode away, where they could still be cowboys. They liked it. But that left a vacuum. Who's going to do that work? And that's when the Chinese come into the picture. They were brought in to build the railroads. Then the railroad was done. So they came down here and became the first farm laborers. They did that thankless job. And for their pain, what did they get? Pain. People didn't like them. They were too different. They were strange and exotic. People believed the worst about them. And many politicians fed the flames of prejudice, saying they'll take your jobs away. And they'll, they'll ruin the state. They'll take over the whole state. Vote for me. I'll get rid of the Chinese. And they beat that old drum. Boom, boom, boom. And did people vote for them? Yes. Did they ban the Chinese? Sadly, yes. They faced incredible prejudice, hard for us to even imagine in our time. Well, the Chinese finally diminished in this area. And at that time, after the Mexican Revolution of 1910, lots of Latinos were literally forced out of their own country. One estimate I read indicated that 25% of the Mexican population moved to the United States. Well, they didn't come here for economic. They came because if they stayed in Mexico, they could easily have been killed in that bloody and terrible 10-year revolution. 
you all hear about Pancho Villa, it's very colorful. It wasn't. If it was a color, it was red. And I don't blame people one bit for coming across the border. And they're the, the start of the large Latino population that's with us to this day. Did so much to make the Southwest bloom into this agricultural paradise. Um, well, Ventura really didn't grow much, just with lima beans and stuff like that. We had dirt roads until 1908. Then it was the discovery of oil. That changed everything. Well, they always knew there was oil here. It was bubbling up out of the ground. You could, in fact, if you go to the beach, you still get it on your feet. It has nothing to do with the offshore drilling. It's always Shumash Native Americans had tar on their feet, too. Um, so they knew it was here, but they couldn't drill it. They didn't have the right equipment. And it took a rotary drill that was invented in the 1920s to get down through the layers of stone to that vast pool of oil still producing at the Ventura Avenue. In fact, at one time, Ventura Avenue oil field was one of the largest in California. Well, they pumped the oil out. Much of it, by the way, went for World War II for the, to fuel the fleets that won victory, which made sense. I mean, if we lost the war, the Japanese would get all the oil. But uh, we used much of that up. But today, new techniques are still being uh, causing that field to be productive. And I'm told by those who know that they found new pools of oil here in Ventura County. Of course, it's more difficult to drill and they have many more safety precautions in place, which is a good thing. But we still have a great deal of oil here in Ventura County. Well, that changed everything. The, the city population in 1924 went from 5,000 to 24,000 in one year. People flooded in, lots of people. One interesting fellow who came around that time was a, a lawyer named Earl Stanley Gardner. Because when you have oil, what do you have? Legal problems, leases, all kinds of different things, insurance, what have you. That was a great place for a young lawyer. But he was always kind of in a rivalry with his brother, who was always making more money than he. So he started to write on the side just to make a little pocket money. Now, at first he wrote Pulp Fiction, and finally uh, he wrote more and more. Finally, he wrote a book, and he created the world's first lawyer who was also a detective. And he was a lawyer himself, so he could make all the legal things just right. He invented Perry Mason, based very loosely on himself. And he went on to, of course, become a world-class mystery writer. He wrote over 82 books in his lifetime, 150 books. And, of course, he went on to become internationally known. And that came right out of Ventura. But oil is what built this town. And the um, oil wells are still an important part. But just as oil is important, we have another pillar of our economy, fruit and agriculture. Well, Richard, speaking about fruit, we've got Ojai just tipped up, up the highway there. Anything special about Ojai and fruit in Ventura County? Well, it's always been an important uh, produce-growing area, but recently those little tangerines you've seen marketed as cuties or clementines, they were developed in Ojai. And not only that, they can grow on hybrid trees that are only grow this high, so you can pick them without using a ladder. A child can peel them. They're so popular that they're, they're planting all kinds of these cutie trees all over the entire part of Ventura County. Train loads of those little fruits are being shipped to the East Coast, and it's been a gold rush for the Ojai Valley and all over Ventura County. So agriculture is still an important part of our economy. What, what else drives the economy here? Any, any scandals? And we have, uh, there might be blood and 
all the things oh, that went into oil. So lots of scandals evolved in there. One of the big things were that they grew so quickly that many men came, mostly from the Midwest, and it also brought with them large amounts of uh, prostitutes. And we had uh, brothels and all sorts of people. Wherever you have oil workers with lots of money, mostly men, uh, in fact, almost all men, coming, well, right behind them will come the ladies of the night. And of course, that brought many a scandal to this area until they finally got a, got a chance to close them down or at least control them to some degree. Just when they got rid of the prostitution brought in by the oil workers, World War II happened, which meant all these sailors and soldiers came to, the, to Ventura. And of course, what does that bring? Ladies of the night who uh, met their needs, if you will, and that brought a new resurgence, and that didn't end until after the war was well over. And then uh, money, uh, large money in Ventura County, or sir? Oh, yes. One of the richest men in Ventura County pretty much owned Port Wyneme was Senator Thomas R. Bard, the first and only United States Senator from Ventura County. He was the only one. And he was incredibly wealthy. He started a little business you may have heard of, Union Oil. And he made money hand over fist, built a huge mansion, which still stands at the uh, Navy base over in Port Wyneme. Of course, that uh, influx of money brought great wealth to all over the county. And, and we have Bard hospitals, and we, he, he invested back in the community as well. A lot of people did, uh, including one of the richest men around, Fritz Hunsinger, mm -hmm. who had been a, a soldier of World War I. And it is at the end of the war, there was, of course, nothing really good going on in Germany at the end of uh, World War I, 1918. So he saved his money, and he had a choice. He could go to Argentina or America. And his mother told him, go to America. And he got on the boat, sailed for the United States in steerage. He had to cross the United States, and all he had was a jar of peanut butter and a loaf of bread for the five-day trip to the United to uh, California. When he got here, he couldn't find a job, even though he was a diesel mechanic. And he finally, all he could do in Ventura was get a job sweeping the floors of an oil company. Wouldn't you know it? Their mechanic quit suddenly over a dispute. So he stepped in, and they liked his work. And little, wouldn't you know it, that he went up the ladder from there, eventually becoming president mm -hmm. of the whole company, and actually uh, gave a lot of money to our community, helped the community hospital grow. In fact, it was the third hospital in the world to actually have uh, an electromagnetic uh, uh, EMI machine. You know, there was uh, one in London, and, and one in the United States, and then right here on Little Ventura. He paid for it out of his own pocket because his wife was ill and needed that for a diagnosis. So lots of that money, the oil money, became center of uh, our wealth here. And new techniques in drilling. Uh, we became a center for drilling right after World War II. A young Navy pilot came with his wife and stayed at the Pierpont Inn for several months learning the oil business. And he later went to use those, that information in Texas to start his own oil company. That was Herbert Walker Bush. And of course, he went on from the oil uh, success to become governor of Texas, then later president of the United States. And so did his son as well. And it all started right here in Ventura. How, how do you let the world know? How do they get a hold of you in terms of, because... The, the well, I'm easy, the easiest man in the world to get in touch with. Just uh, Google uh, Richard Senate, or you can do my website, which is hinkhunter at aol.com. You can email me there, or at I have a, another site, richardsenate.com. And I'm also on Facebook under Richard Senate. So you can't, I'm all over the place. There's no one can say I'm hard to get a hold of. 
uh, even though I don't always answer my phone. <laughs> but email is the best way to contact me, and I do lectures and talks and TV shows. I've actually consulted with movies uh, that deal with a variety of topics, and I helped authors writing about the mystery writer uh, Earl Stanley Gardner. I actually wrote a biography of him. Remarkably, back when I was in high school, I actually met him. I was doing archaeology. That's a, one of my great loves is archaeology. Down by the old mission at the old site of our Chinatown. And we were digging one afternoon, and this short guy, all dressed in khaki, came to the dig site. He was talking about Chinatown. So we all left our pits and joined the group around him. And he talked about, and he punctuated his talk with whole phrases in Chinese. Oh, Mr. Sing Chi lived here, and he did that, you know, and he did this, that, and that. And finally, after about 20 minutes, uh, he left. And I talked to the head archaeologist, Bob Brown, and I asked, uh, who was that man? Oh, that's our old Stanley Gardner. And I said, who? <laughs> I didn't know who it was. I said, oh, you know, the guy who writes Perry Mason, which was, of course, a popular TV show at the time. And so I actually met him and shook his hand. And now I only wish I could go back in time. I have about 25,000 questions I'd like to ask him. Well, Richard, thank you so much for, for uh, letting us start in the beginning of the history of Ventura. Ventura, you really need to engage this, this man in whatever activity you have. You will find out things that you didn't know about uh, where you live. Uh, we also had our, our uh, Matthew from Parkway. If you're a small business and you need accounting, uh, he has a new way of looking at it in terms of technology. But uh, Richard, thank, thank you again. And Ventura, it's time for you to get moving.